gentlemen, it is a pleasure to speak to you today on behalf of Team Odyssey about our strategy for the challenge set last Monday by Dominic Haddock and Ian Smith. The challenge was as follows. To consider the impact of day 14 of the Olympic Games on the Jubilee Line and see how one might alter services to meet the demand generated by the events. We quickly realised our strategy could never solely consist of one big solution, one big measure that could, that could perfectly fit into a budget of £32.5 million pounds, or perfectly solve the transport issues. Rather, it would entail a mixture of measures that, if undertaken, would draw people away from the Jubilee line, ease congestion, and put them onto other means of transport. Again, it was clear that just taking out seats out of the carriages to increase people capacity would not alone, like Ian said, decrease the 62 trains needed in the mornings and the 73 trains needed later in the, in the evenings. We also realised that bizarrely optimistic plans, like getting rid of the trains in the Jubilee Line and just having spectators and tourists and commuters walking up and down the lines, that wasn't really cool. Feasible. <laughs> um, nor was, as one, one person in our team earlier suggested, having tra travelators installed along the Jubilee line and having people sliding along and having to the ground to their destinations. That probably wasn't going to work. No, indeed, what we needed to do was to consider and plan a number of possibilities that together would make the Jubilee line run more smoothly, safely, and in turn bring business to other mediums of transport and even open up opportunities for profit. So anyway, on with the knowledge of what we definitely couldn't do, and a suitable name in Team Odyssey, we decided to come up with three principles as part of our main strategy. These were, <coughs> one, improvement of, of existing train services to in increase capacity for transport. This is basically what we could do to improve what already existed. Secondly, reduction of Jubilee Line users, but targeting spectators and visiting tourists and giving them alternatives for transport and advertising other options, giving them alternatives around going on the Jubilee Line and in turn hopefully decreasing that 62 trains an hour, um, an hour leader. <coughs> Thirdly, again, reduction of Jubilee Line users, but this time targeting domestic commuters, habitual commuters, those who live in London. Coming, um, encouraging private companies to adopt flexi work schemes, work at home week, things like that, and of course, advertising other transport options. So, with three principles, we had to have a strategy to satisfy these three principles, and you'll see it in the presentation we're about to deliver. These were number one, train modification ideas, number two, alternative transport ideas and flexi work plans. Three, contingency and emergency plans. Four, marketing plans, advertising and the like. And five, finance and income generation. So without delaying my colleagues furthermore, I would like to invite you to watch Team Odyssey present to you, and first and foremost, our train modification team. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, we're the train modification team we would like to present various solutions to cope with the rush hour during the Olympic week. Firstly, an idea to make smoother and safer journeys during this period is to have platform barriers at busy stations such as Stratford. These will provide increased capacity up on the platform without the station having to close off. Another idea we're looking at is having specific Olympic express trains which would run directly from London Bridge up until Stratford where the Olympic Park is. We believe this is a good idea, especially during the rush hours, as it was suggested that you need up to 65 trains an hour when you can only provide 30. But by doing this, we'd eliminate one of the most congested zones, which is around Canary Wharf and Canada Waters, where obviously there are a lot of workers working. To do this, to accommodate for these people, we could have specific buses which run from London Bridge up to Canary Wharf if there are workers who do, who do need to get to work. But another suggestion can be put forward by one of my colleagues later is that they could be businesses in Canary Wharf could look at flexi work or allowing workers to work from home during this period, which would also be a benefit during the period when there are going to be a lot of Olympic travellers going to the, the games and also people who need to get to work. With the actual modification of the, actual, of the trains, what we're proposing is to take out the seats. 
And uh, we found that just by doing this, we can free up an extra 29% of capacity, capacity capacity. And that's based on calculations which we'll explain in just a minute. Freeing up more space in the carriages would increase the number of people that can be transported per, per hour by an extra 7,000. This will mean that cons consumer satisfaction will increase as less people will miss their trains. And uh, however, there are a few issues. Um, firstly, on the other hand, people may find discomfort with our seats. And uh, also, there may be safety issues. However, on the contrary, these two problems could be solved by, because we were thinking you could place rest at the downside, these cushion rests, they're already in place by the doors that you use. So we're thinking placing them down on both sides and increasing the number of handles to hold on to. And uh, we also do comprehend the fact that this will cost money. We will now be able to accommodate 1,044 people as opposed to the present 811. This is an increase of 30% and means that 7,000 more people can travel on the tube per hour. So thank you for listening to us and I now hand you over to the Alternate Ideas team. Hi there, uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are the team in charge of, uh, responsible for researching alternative ideas and to kick things to kick things off, I would like to uh, discuss the river and how we can use it more effectively. Now, currently, the Thames Clipper service is already a far scenic way of travelling along the Thames. As the route stands, it could potentially carry passengers from many central locations along the Thames to the various Greenwich venues and the Royal Auxiliary Barracks. Now, the current Clipper fleet, consisting of 13 boats, uh, ranging from 62 to 220 seat capacities, potentially ferries 500 passengers an hour along the Thames. So obviously this isn't a large enough quantity to deal with the demand uh, increase from uh, the Olympic Games. So what do we suggest? Uh, we did initially think of increasing the size of the fleet. However, after talking to the press office from uh, the Thames Clipper people, we came to the conclusion that this was not feasible given the time constraints or, or budget constraints. So um, we decided to approach several uh, boat, uh, private, privately owned boat rental companies. However, they weren't exactly keen about working alongside TFL. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that's personal or what, but uh, in fact, one, one boat company did claim to own no boats. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, some did suggest that they would be running similar services during the game, so uh, uh, ultimately, this would increase their uh, capacity for travel. Another alternate method is utilising the bicycle sharing scheme that starts on the 30th of July 2010. This scheme is being funded by Barclays, therefore not costing transport for London, allowing them to use their budget in other areas. The introduction of this scheme will start with 6,000 bicycles with over 200 hubs, stretching across central London from areas like Kensington and Chelsea to Tower Hamlets and Hackney. A possibility could be to have a hub at each Olympic venue to help the tourists even more. However, this could be expanded and I have sent out an email to Barclays asking them whether they have already any plans or would be willing to expand for the 2012 Olympics. Since the current area only comes to the central zone of the Olympic site, so one within the river zone and the Olympic Park would definitely ease tension on the amount of people using the underground. There has been no reply up till now, but I feel if the Transport for London team or the Mayor of London could apply pressure on Barclays to expand within these two years prior to the Olympics. We think if you were to increase the capacity, amount and frequency of buses, it would be taking great deal of pressure off the GB line. Your existing rail replacement buses could be used to achieve this. Our research shows that a rail replacement bus for the GB line was used in January 2010, so this is definitely possible. We have realised that extra capacity can be allowed for as the games are taking place during the summer period when many people go on holiday. However, if you wanted to increase the capacity of the buses, you could use bendy buses, which would mean that much more of the Jubilee Line commuters could use them. The journey could be sped up by making the railway placement buses go straight to Stratford without stopping. Building on this idea, we suggest there are five transport hubs, Waterloo, Liverpool Street, King's Cross, Paddington and Victoria. The buses would travel straight straight from these stations to Stratford Olympic Park and the Greenwich Peninsula without stopping in their own Olympic bus route name. The amount of TFL staff available will also be a problem. 
So we thought that to counteract this problem, we, we could ask the staff to work more hours or employ more people. This doesn't come without a price though, so we thought for the um, placement bus services we should have a £3 return bus ticket, which is half of the tube travel card, meaning people would be more inclined to take the bus rather than the tube. Another idea is that you could set up an Olympic travel card for the whole for the month. Um, this would include trains, buses, boats and rail replacement services. To decrease the number of domestic commuters which travel at peak time, we propose that lunch offices encourage their employees to work from home. This would work in the company's and employees' favour because less time is being spent <coughs> travelling, resulting in more work being done. If the employees travel when people are on their way to the Olympics, it will take them much longer and will therefore turn up to work stress and as a result of this, they won't be able to perform to their full potential. When suggesting this idea to companies, you can argue that if they don't offer flexi work, then the staff will be more inclined to take sick days, which means they can make a loss. By employees choosing to take their holiday during the Olympics, they will be less likely to Skype and furthermore, the employees will be more motivated if they know that they don't have a hectic journey ahead of them. Canary Wharf is known for being one of the largest business communities in London, with approximately 200,000 workers visiting daily. Congestion is already a problem. We are aware that not everyone will be able to work from home. However, even by cutting the number of tube passengers to Canary Wharf by 40%, it means that 80,000 less people will be travelling at peak times every day. Thank you. I would now like to introduce them.
and application for smartphones, including features such as a live feed showing all delays and congestion on tubes and trains, so Londoners and tourists can plan ahead to avoid the busiest areas. It would also include a tube map from zones 1 to 6, with a built-in journey plan to help find alternative routes around the tube system, and would give the time taken for each route. As well as this, the application would also include a street map to support people who decide to walk or cycle their journey instead of using the tube. Even at a low cost, this application has the potential for huge profitability for London Underground, as most people are more than happy to pay a few pence for a very useful application. Customers would be able to find out about this application through the London 2012 website, and for iPhone users, the Apple Store. Facebook and Twitter have additionally proved themselves to be an extremely useful means of connecting to the masses. Live updates can be used during the Olympic Games, as with the phone application, informing the public of congested areas they should push to avoid. In the run-up to the Games, these websites will be used to remind Londoners to plan extra time into their journeys, as a normal community can take a much longer time than normal. Facebook alone reached out to over 400 million users globally, so it would be a very effective way of communicating to tourists from all other countries in the world and preparing them for London transport system for the Games. We also think that a poster campaign should be used in most tube stations around the world, but on the Jubilee Line in particular, and also in stations near the Olympic venues. These posters would use slogans to make it clear to Londoners that their normal commute would be completely disrupted during the Games, and aim to deter them away from trying to travel to work during the busiest times. The posters would suggest that Londoners walk, cycle, take the bus or the boat during a 16-day period as much as possible and emphasise the fact that the tubes may cause some inconvenience to their journey, so they must plan ahead of time. As well as the Jubilee Line, this campaign would be useful on the DLR, Bakerloo and District Lines as these all have stops near the venues. Thank you for listening. I would now like to pass on to our finance team. Hi, we're the finance team, and over the past few days we've been looking into financing our proposed operations and seeing if there are any possible ways of generating some income. So we've come up with the objective to generate profits from the Olympics, to reinvest into future ventures without compromising TFL service and legacy during the games. Our main aim for this Olympics for TFL, we think, should be just to provide the highest standard of service, as there currently is, for all the spectators to allow flawless and efficient transport between their, their, where they're staying and the Olympic venue. And secondly, another aim, slightly less important, will still be considered if there are any possible ways from which we can um, create any revenue. Following our main objective, we have created these strategic ideas to fulfill the desired standard of service and profit through increasing the original underground budget of £32.5 million. Pounds. Associations, a green tax, special Olympic travel cards, and the increase in travel flares will help make these aims feasible. We are well aware that increasing the budget is one of the hardest feats. However, via merchandising and sponsorship, we believe we are able to improve pre-existing uh, uh, transport infrastructures as well as alternative transport schemes. There is scope to merchandise pre-existing uh, merchandisers on the website mentioned by the marketing team. We have also been in contact with large companies such as HSBC, and Virgin uh, to see their interest in domestic awareness campaigns, adverts in newspapers such as the Evening Standard, the Metro, and post campaigns around TFL networks. Unfortunately, they have shown little interest. In my opinion, that is because we are a small group of teenagers on the business course. <laughs> um, with uh, contact from the TFL head office, I'm sure that our proposed plans will run much smoothly. On this course and challenge, I'd like to be the first to say we're out of dogs. A fairly decent knowledge of a TFL network would be a very obvious outcome of this project. We developed skills to important the skills. With only a few days to go through a huge amount of work, we couldn't have done it without service and enhancing cohesion. Teamwork was something learnt and best communication products are learnt. We also learned that listening to others was crucial for us to go to Unless well cast that. Well, I hope through all the ideas and points raised today, you get an idea of the way in which we tackled this transport conundrum, and that you realise our big solution is, in essence, a mixture of solutions. 
and I hope that some of these suggestions are valid and mature. Um, but it wasn't an easy task. I mean, it was amazing to see everyone respond to the challenge and actually at the end of the day, I think, enjoy the challenge as well. But a big thank you must go to David, or to David Okoro for his time and effort in uh, guiding us through this task and to the Hampton and Serpton staff who arranged the week and made it happen. And then the last thank you, obviously, to you, the audience, for taking time out of what must be a busy schedule to listen to us. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it.
thank you obviously for taking, for taking time out of your um, busy day to listen to the presentation. Also, thank you to TFL for um, presenting the team with uh, such an easy, sorry, not easy, <laughs> such a difficult um, challenge. And you know, a special thank you to yourself, Ian and Dominic, for for the um, for the way that you delivered the uh, challenge on Monday. Although it seems like such a long time ago now. But, but, but also for your commitment to uh, what we're trying to do in the EIA and also your commitment to try to promote talent amongst your people and getting them to focus on why the enterprise and being more entrepreneurial is important. I'd also like to say thank you as well um, to Mr. Newman and Mr. Davey for the support this week. Mr. Uh, Marsh. Mr. Marsh, sorry. <laughs> Just testing. Mr. Marsh. Um, for your support this week and, and also for you know being so hospitable to myself and, and helping me get through this week as well. And more importantly, uh, well done, ladies and gentlemen, you've been fantastic this week. It's been a very difficult challenge. You had one and a half days to complete most of the work and you did it. Um, all of the feedback justifies the hard work, justifies the headaches and the stress that you've been through over the last couple of days. And I want you to remember this moment, not tomorrow, but in a few years' time when you, as professional people, present to audiences and remember you know, the benefit that you have, have gained from today and how that will help you in your future careers. I also want you to remember each other as well as potential you know, long-term friends and hopefully colleagues and business partners in the future because uh, there are some outstanding people um, sat around this room and, st and standing up as well. Which is what I meant. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and you know, I hope that you've taken away um, all of the all of the concepts and the ideas that we focused on this week, and that they will be of a, of a benefit to so, you. Um, first person to receive a certificate is Izzy. Round of applause, please, for Izzy.
what you've gone through, and where did you present it? Who listened to you? You presented in a boardroom of London Underground at HQ. No other young people in the country have had this experience in the time frame you've done. Keep in touch with him. If your idea is news, I'm sure that it will be recognised by uh, Ian and the team. But again, <laughs> I'm sure they'll be recognised by Ian and the team. And again, when they are, and you're going for a job interview, or you're at 2012, be proud of saying, well, this is a contribution you've made for London, because in turn, that will help you in your futures. So I think, you know, a massive round of applause to all of you. You've done outstanding. And, uh, so